Imagine beginning your career out of the love for coding, then helping with the creation of one of the world's biggest tech companies, Pinterest, and then moving on to founding your own tech company, Gumroad. This is the story of Sahil Lavingya. This is an entrepreneurship special of the Ranveer Show. Lots of business learnings, lots of perspectives from Silicon Valley and the tech world in general. Sahil Lavingya is on the Ranveer Show today. But before I let you slip into this insightful episode of the Ranveer Show, we've got to announce that TRS will soon become a Spotify exclusive. That means that before it's released on YouTube, 48 hours before it's released on YouTube, the audio versions of all the podcast episodes will be released exclusively on Spotify. That's right. Watch out. Follow us on Spotify. But for now, slip in to this beautiful episode of TRS with Sahil Lavingya. Sahil Lavingya, thank you for being on the Ranveer Show, brother. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. I love talking to entrepreneurs. I just feel like uh, through the medium of storytelling, you know, especially when you're talking about your own story, your own business's story, there's a lot of little learnings that happen through your mistakes, through your experiences. But also just generally, there's a lot of subject-related learning so I follow you on Twitter. I know that you're a dude who studies a lot of different things. Uh, you study psychology, you study human beings, you study business for sure. Maybe maybe on a slightly deeper level uh, than most people. So while we will talk about Gumroad, uh, I want to ask you everything about your life because you began your business journey really early. You began in college and that's not how a lot of Indians think. People think that, okay, let me wait till I turn 22, 23, once I'm out of college, that's when I'll start. And you started like pretty early, man. So first of all, what was the thought behind that? And secondly, uh, how did you deal with being from an, a traditional Indian family? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I got started, yeah, super early. Uh, designed, uh, started designing websites when I was in middle school or high school, I think. And then the app store, the iPhone app store, came out in 2009 when I was in high school and I started making iPhone apps. Uh, and it was really just fun, honestly. Like I think a lot of it was, you know, <laughs> in, in a lot of career paths, you have to, there are certain things you have to do. There's certain, you know, either you have to get a degree or certification or you have to go through some path. Whereas with, with software, it's one of the few things where you can just, you know, it doesn't matter really. Like if you've made something good, people can pay you money for it. And that was just very freeing to me and very, just really cool. Like I could build something and then people could, you know, pay for it. And then I could build more stuff, right? Which is sort of a line that I think has followed me since uh, with Gumroad and, and other things. How did you figure that the stuff you were building counted as good? Like how were you so sure that it was good? And what apps did you build back then? Yeah, there, there, there are two, there are two things. I mean, one, one is you can charge money for it, right? And I think I always, even in the beginning, I don't think I ever released anything for free. Uh, even if it was ninety nine cents on the app store or something like that, I made, you know, uh, I made an app. Funnily enough, in the one of the first apps I made, maybe the first was uh, called Taxi Law, which was a, a an app that allows you to call a cab from your phone. <laughs> uh, but, you know, this is before uh before uber and all of that stuff um and you know so i just built it often i would solve my own problem i think that's the other sort of signal that you can use uh, to know if something's useful is like i think a lot of people they get into it uh and they say i need to start a company i need to start a business like what problem can i go solve and that's really hard i found that really difficult it's much easier for me to be like just look around my own life and there's plenty of things that i can improve I think it's sort of early days, uh, you know, and, and there, there's just problems everywhere. Why, according to yourself, do you think Pinterest has become the Pinterest today? If you were employee number two, you saw a lot. So what went right for that organization? Yeah, when I joined, we had something like 15,000 users. And now there's probably, I don't know, 100 million, 150 million users. I don't know what it's at now. Um, it's sort of a thousand X. I mean, I think... Uh, 
it's it's honestly it's it's weird because you know it, a lot of people ask like what was it like being there that early and i'm like look it's probably like most startups are that early you know it's a bunch of people in a room shipping code uh i mean i think what made it really big was just the fact that it solved a problem for a lot of people uh and when we started getting that initial traction, even though we only had, you know, tens of thousands of users, the sort of engagement metrics per user were just insane. And the value, like it was so clear when you talk to somebody or even when you use the product yourself, the amount of value that was being created uh, was just immense. And we were really competing with like the Internet Explorer bookmarks folder, right? This is like how people would track things you know if you want to sort of catalog a bunch of recipes that you want to make or something you'd have like an internet explorer bookmarks folder and we just kind of like at least that's the way that i thought about it i can't speak for the for the whole company but the way i thought about it was like we're just we're just taking this sort of like very old school traditional thing and we're just making it a software startup putting it in the cloud making it social which is similar to what you know people did like what facebook did to to the Facebook, et cetera, right? We were just taking like scrapbooking and these very physical things that people were doing already and just sort of saying, what is the web 2.0 version of this, right? What What is the equivalent of collecting and curating online for like a mainstream audience? And I think that's all, you know, that all would have led to a meaningful company. Uh, but I think the thing that really catapulted it was Facebook. And I think we just sort of time, I mean, similar to Instagram, I think timing wise, you know, it, it's kind of like PayPal and eBay back in the day, you have a platform in Facebook that's growing like crazy. And uh, Pinterest was just the perfect sort of thing to ride that wave. Because with Pinterest, one, one thing that's unique about Pinterest is it's mostly about uh, uh, curation. It's not about content creation, which is which means that you can effectively do an action a hundred times in five minutes, right? If you're pinning a bunch of things for a wedding, for example, you're not going to tweet a hundred times. You couldn't do that. It would break, like it would be very sort of like against the sort of social etiquette of the platform. Whereas with Pinterest, that's what it's about. It's about repinning, you know, as much content as possible, uh, primarily for yourself. And then, you know, the sort of algorithm and stuff will kind of distribute that to people. And I think with Facebook at the beginning, uh, when their algorithm was, was really simple. It was like, if people are doing an action on a website a thousand times a day, you know, we're going to, that's important. We're going to put that on Facebook and, you know, with open graph and you'd see all your friends. So I remember within like a, a, a six month period or something, I, you know, it went from like, you know, I would tell friends, like I work at this thing and they're like, cool. Like, what is that? To like seeing Pinterest on my feed, like every day because, because of that. So I think, you know, every startup needs, a few of those moments to get to the next level, especially in a time scale that's rapidly compressed, you're not going to get to a $30 billion valuation in 10 years without certain mm. events helping you along the way. But I think it's like, you know, it's kind of like hard work meets luck, right? Like we prepared and we had a really great product. And then I think the company had a few of these instances that really just kind of skyrocketed. And then, you know, it's a network effect. At some point you become big enough that it's just a snowball, right? More people, like in terms of all the competition went away and it was just like a clear line of sight um, to, you know, to a multi-billion dollar company. But it's still, I think, you know, surpassed expectations for me. I did not think it was going to be a 30 billion. I don't think anyone, when they invested, I don't think, you know, like even the it's just valuations of companies in general have, have grown so much in the last 10 years in technology, even in the last year because of COVID. So I think it's, you know, who knows like where, where things go, but that's sort of, that's some of the, some of the, some of the insight there. But like on a very business level, what was the founder doing right? Or what was correct culturally within that organization that allowed it to scale this much? Yeah. I mean, I think Ben has always just been a phenomenal communicator. I think that's something that I really try to, to copy effectively. And I didn't realize you know, back then I was, that was my first professional experience, right? So I don't know how many people, their first boss also is a boss of a, a CEO of a $30 billion public company. Uh, so I think that, you know, I, I feel like I, I, I almost get to cheat because similarly to that kind of like, you need that, those moments in a company, I feel like I had those moments as an individual, whereas I, I was able to learn from someone that that competent 
or that had the capability to be that competent over time, right? Very few people can can do that. But I think he he just communicates really well. I think he's always been very good at making sure everyone is aligned on like what we do, why we do it, what problems are we trying to solve? How are we trying to solve those problems? Who is our ideal customer or user? You know, like why should we, you know, why are we not building these certain things? Uh, and I think culture, a lot of it just comes down to like, why are people in the room? And I think he's just been really good at making sure that people are in the room for the right reason. Uh, but certainly I'm sure Pinterest had a lot of it, you know, its own set of cultural problems as any company that scales that quickly does. And, you know, last couple of years, there's been a lot of stuff in the media, like there would be for any, I think, multi-billion dollar company with thousands and thousands of employees. But I think in the early days of which I can really only speak for, for those, I think it was just like an insane focus on product and insane focus on the, on sort of user experience, uh, and just making sure that everyone that joins the company is a really, really good human being. Uh, and then I also think the the, the cheating, I think the, the way that Pinterest can sort of cheat is you never really had to worry too much about the business side of things because it, there's such a built-in commerce aspect that everyone can kind of say, okay, if Pinterest gets to 50 million monthly active users, you know, we can see it with Twitter, we can see it with Facebook, we can see it with Instagram, we can see it with Snapchat. There's a pretty clear path to monetization here. Like clearly people are using the product to find products to purchase, you know, furniture to buy, weddings to plan. Like there's so much uh, opportunity there. And so I think that allowed the, the company and the team to really focus on the product, knowing that there was like a very clear, you know, if and when we get to this benchmark, we can pivot and focus on on, on revenue and, and probably do really well at it. Um, whereas other companies, you know, that are a little bit more like Snapchat, I think is a good example where like, I think they spent a, quite a few years, even as a public company where people were like, how is this thing going to work? It's a bunch of kids using this thing. They don't even have any data. They delete all the data every 24 hours, you know, after 24 hours. And now it's a 40, $40 billion company. So uh, it turns out, you know, if you hire a really great team and you have, a, a you know, you really care, like, and you're a software company, you're, you're like often, you're likely to figure that stuff out over time. But I think, you know, 10 years ago, even Facebook, when they IPO sort of tanked, I think it was still very unclear, um, you know, if, the, if this was really going to be a sort of a sustainable thing, which like nowadays is laughable, right? Like I remember back in the day, people were saying, you know, Facebook, you know, all of their users are, are going to start using it on their phone. That was sort of new. How, how do you advertise on a phone? There's only so much screen real estate. Um, and obviously that's been proven. Yes, you can advertise on a phone. There's a way to advertise on a phone. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, there's nothing too crazy. And sometimes it sounds, it's like, I don't know if you, when you, when you talk to someone like a, like a, a professional basketball player and you say, how are you so good? They're like, well, I play a lot of basketball and I do the, you know, I'd like run the fundamentals and I, and it's just like, yeah, but what, like, what else is there? You know? And I feel like sometimes that's talking about businesses similar where it's just like you, you know, you build a product, you make sure it solves the problem, you scale, you find new customers, you do it over and over and over again. And I think the, the, it's sort of like, it's like, it's like the hardest things are the simple things, right? Uh, everyone wants like the, the, you know, what's the thousand instruction manual that I can follow to build a massive company. But the truth is there isn't really one, right? It's like, if you want to test someone's ability at cooking, you don't tell them to cook some elaborate meal. You could say, cook me an omelet. And I will know how good you are at everything else. I don't even need to see any of that stuff. Or a, 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 a teacher of mine, he used to say, or he says, uh, you can tell if someone's good at piano within three seconds. <laughs> like you don't need to literally like within three seconds, you know, if someone can play the piano or not, there's no way to fake that. And I think product development is similar where like once you, you, you really just want to work on the core competency, the core skill. And that just comes from like building, iterating, talking to customers and doing that over and over and over again. And I think Ben has always had that obsession. Uh, you know, he was the CEO of the company, but he was also doing basically all of customer support uh, for several months when, when I was there. So he's always been like, you know, uh, and I'm sure if you go to his Pinterest account now, he's still like an avid user of the product. He still uses it all the time. Um, and I think very few people continue to do that. I also learned like there's nothing crazy. There's no secret sauce, right? Like I think it was just a bunch of people. I thought they were pretty smart. You know, I don't think we're any 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 of us were just like incredible. 
uh, we just, you know, found a problem, solved it. And, and I think that's helpful for me to know too, right? Is I think some people get caught up in the idea that they can't do something, that they need access to something or they need some degree or they need some amount of money or they need uh, a skill that they don't have, talent that they don't have. Um, and I think a lot of those are just excuses or, or they're lies. Like they were lies that people told you so that they would have less competition effectively. Gumroad, the idea, considering the fact that you did your entrepreneurship uh, thing when you were a teenager and you figure that, okay, let's address real world problems and start a business because of those real world problems. Then you work at Pinterest, you get all this experience. Then that adds layers to those solutions for the real world problems. So what in your head made you want to start Gumroad? Yeah, I mean... I think that's a big part of it is just like the the depth, the complexity of which I could sort of think about these these problems was a big one for me. Um, and seeing the impact, right? Seeing like, oh wow, if I if I don't think about the stuff I was building as oh these like random things that I'm I'm shipping for fun on the side to to buy Xbox games, but instead as like a, a way to change the world and and build a really valuable company and product and team and and grow as a as a human being. This like the aspirations that I, I I think grew within me just sort of via osmosis, right? Just like sort of pulling it from the people around me, uh, sort of Silicon Valley culture. And and it also gave me the network. And I think that was another key point uh, is like I had these ideas and I would build stuff and, you know, I'd build something and I'd chip it and it would be cool. And then I'd build something else and I'd chip it and it would be cool. And then when I moved to Silicon Valley, all of a sudden it was like, hey, you built this thing, like. Have you thought about starting a company? It was such a different way of thinking about it. And so I think those two things combined to be like, oh, this is possible. Like there are these people that I really respect. Maybe I followed them on Twitter for a long time. People like Naval and other folks. And they're like, you know, they want to give me money to start a company. And I can go like all of these things. Like when I went to school, my goal was I would be in school for four years. I would join Google or something. I do that for a few years. I join a startup. I do that for a few years and then maybe one day I'd start a company, right? This would be like a 10 to 20 year thing. And I was in no rush to do that. Uh, and I thought that was kind of, you know, even though I was doing all the software stuff, I still felt like there was a professional path and that was kind of different. Uh, and maybe it was, maybe the internet kind of consolidated those th two things as I was, you know, kind of coming up. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was really uh, people in the Valley who were like, hey, you can start a company, we'll give you money you can basically just mess around for a couple of years and, you know, see what happens. And we trust that you'll figure, you know, you'll, you'll have a good shot at, at figuring something out. Um, and if it doesn't work, you know, similar to Pinterest, like if it doesn't work, go back to school. If it doesn't work, go work at a company, right? Like you're not gonna, you're not going to be down. I think one of the, the, the best things about the culture over there is like failure is like a good thing because it means that you learned a bunch of stuff and that people are willing to pay you to take those learnings and apply them to their company. So you're almost like, you know, it's sort of, it felt to me like a win-win situation. Certainly I was giving up the, the position at Pinterest and stuff, but it just felt like, yeah, I want like starting a company, having this opportunity at this age, this early in my life, like, how can I say no to that? Yeah, I could, you know, people like Naval and Max Levchin and Kurosaka and, and all of these folks are like giving me money, just like paying me basically to do this. Uh, and so I, I felt like I just, it, w it, w it was like, imagine if there's like a door all the way over there and you're like, no one gets to that door, right? Like no one does. So it's not worth thinking about uh, one in every hundred thousand people get to that door. And then all of a sudden someone's like, Hey, you, you know, here's a key, like, and it's open for you. You don't even think about it, to be honest. You don't even, maybe you should be like, well, do I even want to go through that door? Like what's even on the other side of that? But when you get that option, it's kind of like, you know, yes, like whatever, like Wait. it's, it must be worth it. So what did people, what do you think those guys saw in you specifically? Like, what do you think you did right? I think there's so many people who want to start a company, want to start a business. They're more excited about that. Uh, but really to build a business, like you got to build a product. And the, the business is kind of like the, the kind of like sprinkles on the product. Uh, but really the core thing you're selling is the product. And so I think I meet, you know, I'll meet a team of people that's like three MBAs. And I'm like, what are you building? They're like, oh, we're building some software. I'm like, who, <laughs> who's building the software? Oh, we, you know, we, we have it, you know, we're outsourcing that. I'm like, well, imagine you try to start a band and you said, you know, none of us play instruments, uh, but we really want to start a band. <laughs> 
So we hired some people. I'm like, that doesn't work. <laughs> Frankly, it doesn't mm. work. Um, it just, to me, shows a lack of either conviction or sacrifice or like you're not willing to do the work. What was the idea behind Gumroad? What was your core idea? What was the core problem you were solving? And in your early stage of business, what did you learn about life that you didn't know prior to starting Gumroad? Yeah, I think, you know, in the beginning, it, the problem that I was solving for myself was I had an audience online. I wanted to sell something that I made, this icon, to them. I had a thing. I had the audience. I just needed to, like, give them a link and they could give me a dollar. You know, they could fill out a credit card form. And it was mind boggling to me that that wasn't possible. Like it just wasn't, you know, this is 2011 before Stripe launched. Like it was just so hard to accept payments on the internet. Um, you'd have to sort of say PayPal me money and then like give them a Dropbox. It was just weird. It was a very manual process. Uh, and I sort of, you know, kind of considered it like a lemonade stand. Like if you just wanted to like set something up really simply and sell it to people who already were in your radius, uh, it wasn't wasn't easily possible, and so that was the problem we solved initially. And the the sort of the, the reason I became interested in it broadly is that I felt like the internet was connecting all of these people. All of a sudden, you know, musicians didn't have to talk to magazines, uh, and CEOs didn't have to talk to journalists, and politicians didn't have to go through the traditional people. Everyone was now building an audience on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest. Uh, YouTube, etc. Similar to this, right? You don't have to, you can reach a huge amount of people now who all have a direct relationship with you. And I thought that was awesome. But a missing component was the transactional element. Like the, you know, the next step for me would be, well, why wouldn't you just pay everybody directly? Why would you build this amazing relationship? And then say, okay, now you have to go over there to buy my products. You have to buy them from this per from Target, you have to go to Target to buy my products, Target's going to make the majority of the money, I'll get a little bit. Uh, it just didn't make sense to me, it, it, you know, kind of D to C, which is what's happening now. It just made sense for me to like to think, well, if you're, you know, if you're selling a product, you should be selling directly. And so that was the core, kind of the core thing that that I think I, I really was excited about was I just I felt like there was going to be a shift. Uh, and it was, I don't think it was a unique insight. I think a lot of people saw it. I just had the problem and I solved the problem. And then I was able to kind of start on that journey. I think in terms of what I learned, you know, in the early days from it, uh, it's really hard. I think when you build, when, when, all of a sudden, when I wanted, when I wanted this thing to grow like crazy, because that was now my, it was before it was like, we'll see what happens, right? This one, I was like, no, I need, I want this to, to actually grow. I realized how hard it is to get people to change their behavior. Most people, and I, I tweet about this a lot in different ways, but basically people are, people have inertia, right? Sort of like things that are in motion, stay in motion. People, things that are still, stay still, uh, whatever the second law of thermodynamics or something. And that's true of humans, right? Like in general, if you're not working out and you're not going for a run every day, unlikely that you're going to go for a run today. If you go for a run every single day for the last three years, very high odds you're going to go for a run today. It just, you won't even think about it. It's just something you do. Uh, and I think that's similar in all of these different facets. And so when you start building a product, you're like, oh, it's so easy. You just solve a problem. And then you like show it to the people whose problem you solved and they'll pay you money. And then you realize like, no, they're happy. Like they're, they're living their life. They have a certain level of sort of things that they do challenges already. They have certain risk aversion. It's really hard to get someone to actually change what they're doing. Um, and with Gumroad, some, you know, for some people it's like, Hey, this, this way that you currently earn a living today is bad. You should earn a living in this new way. It's better. That's really hard to, to even deal with. Even if it's, it's like, if you're religious and someone says, you know, it's like, it, you won't even listen to the argument because it's so core to your identity. You have to be willing to let that go first before you're even willing to listen. Uh, and I think it's similar. I always tell people that the example I use is, is Coke. You walk into people are like, oh, it's so easy. I'm so free. I, I only do the best products. I like, I, I don't, I don't care about ads. I don't care about any of that stuff. And I'm always like, like if you go to a store and you buy potato chips or you buy a, a can of soda, you buy Coke, you buy Lay's, you, you know, like, do you, you go to, I, I promise you, if you go to the store, there's going to be other options, brands you've never heard of, but you've never tried any of those things. Why? Because you're not, you're, st you're stuck in a loop. Like you're doing the same thing. You're going to the brands that you trust, the names that you're familiar with. Are these other things going to kill you? No, but your, your body, you just can't help but sort of stay away from that. And so I think it's similar. It's like, it takes, it takes, it's like really feels like pushing a boulder up a hill 
where you, mm. it takes a long time to get to that. Now Gumroad's big enough. We've been around long enough. People are like, of course I would use Gumroad for this, right? Now we have the, we're on the other, now the boulder's kind of rolling down the hill in a sense. But in the beginning, I think people are surprised often how hard it is. And I think as, as an investor, it's often why I focus so much on that building and shipping component. It's because a lot of people are like, oh, I'm so good at business. I'm so good at this. You know, I'm so good at selling and build company building even. All I got to do is figure out the product stuff. And I'm like, no, that you, you're not going to, that's <laughs> most people fail here. Like at every level, there's like a 10% that get through, you know? Um, and so if you can't do this beginning thing, none of this other stuff is going to matter. Uh, and I think a lot of people who don't build, it's kind of like the, the musicians who've hired the, the you know, outsourced the, the, the guitars or whatever. It's, I think people don't really realize how hard it is and how you need that feedback loop to be really compressed, right? Because you need to talk to a customer and then you, you got to fix the thing, yeah. do it again and again and again. And if you, every time just, you do that, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, you get the point. Just to, uh, yeah, I, I do. I'm so sorry I'm interrupting <laughs> you, but I got to okay. give my listeners some context sure. on your customer experience. So in 2020, what is a Gumroad customer going through? Like, could you explain why someone would open the app? What would they do on it? Just run the people through that process yeah. and then I can take you back to the story. Totally. Yeah. So creators, you know, musicians, designers, writers, filmmakers, photographers, anyone that wants to sell digital content already has an audience. We make it really easy for them to basically create a digital storefront. So they can go to Gumroad, they sign up, they upload their products, right? They upload their music or their ebook or their videos or, or what have you. And then we give them these pages that they can customize and then share on social media or on their blog or their newsletter. So it's just within five minutes, basically, we we'll want to make it possible for an author to sell their ebook or a filmmaker to sell a workshop or any of these things. And then on the on the buyer side, you you come to this page. It's really simple, beautiful landing page, uh, heavily optimized for conversion. Uh, again, like one of the key insights we had was if you or if you're a lemonade stand, you don't need that much, right? People already know who you are. They just want to support you. And so we make it a super streamlined experience because of that. Um, you know, with a preview and a name and a price and a buy button, you hit buy, you fill out a credit card. Uh, you know, it's beautiful and simple and you hit pay, you get a little receipt that like comes down in a nice animation. You hit download or watch or listen or whatever the, the, you know, the file sort of the, the product is, um, and then you start consuming whatever that is, right? And you're, you have a, a, you know, an email in your inbox if you, need, if you need to go back to it, et cetera. But you're just, the goal is basically, if you're a creator, we want to make it super fast and simple for you to sell content. And if you're a buyer, we want to make it really easy and fast for you to buy the content and consume the content. I, I read this like thing about your Gumroad journey. There was a point where you had to lay off about 75% of the organization. Yeah. So uh, what was this story? Like, why did that happen? And uh, man, I've had a few fires in my life and it's been, it's been difficult. I think I've, I've kind of gotten used to it, but I can't imagine what you went through back then. Yeah, it was tough. I mean, so, you know, we, we had sort of a high rise in the beginning. We raised the million dollar seed round from, you know, Naval and Max Levchin and, and, and a bunch of these great investors in the early days. And then we raised a $7 million series A from Kleiner in 2012 with a tiny team. So we had three or four years kind of to figure things out. And then tw that went by really fast. 2015, uh, you know, we have product market. We are like, we're, again, do we have it? I don't know. It felt like we had it. We were growing. We had a bunch of users. People were making a bunch of money. Uh, but we just weren't growing sort of venture fast, right? Like venture, you, know, you kind of need to be growing at this sort of exponential rate if you want to create these, you know, outsized outcomes. And we just weren't doing that. And so I talked to, you know, it felt like I talked to everybody. I talked to maybe a hundred or more firms, like VC firms, not just individuals, but like, you know, I went down to Sandal Road and went in an office and pitched Gumroad and got rejected 100% of the time, like every single time, uh, which is very different than the first time where I felt like I got mostly yeses. And so it was a very, very different experience um, and lear learning experience for me, for sure. Uh, and so, yeah, we basically were like, what are we going to do? We, we can't raise money. We're not profitable yet. We sort of overscaled, kind of like you have to kind of assume that you're going to be successful and kind of grow ahead of where you think you are. And that sort of, you know, the venture capital kind of model. Uh, and uh, and so, yeah, in 20, 2015, we raised a small bridge round from Kleiner Perkins to give us a year of runway, which kind of buried the company in, in preference, in liquidation preferences, which basically means like, 
uh, for every, you know, you have to pay them back a multiple of what they put in first to kind of make it worth it for them to keep this company alive. Uh, and I don't, you know, I don't regret that. I just, it was just the, what ha- had to happen. And yeah, we, so we had a year and we said, we're going to focus purely on growth. See how, can we fix this? Uh, we really believed that we could turned out we couldn't. And then in, in August, October of 2015, uh, I told the team, or I told him, I told them in January, like, this is likely not going to work. We think it has the potential to, and no one left and we all doubled down. We all worked like crazy. We all focused on growth. It was like only growth. Uh, we called it moving the needle. Like we only work on things that move the needle and it didn't work. Mm-hmm. And so, so nine months, 10 months in, we, we did a round of layoffs. We went from, yeah, 75% of the company from 20 people down to five people. And then ultimately, you know, from five down to just me and I rebuilt the, the company from oh, wow. basically from scratch in 2016. Yeah. Uh, Again, like this is why knowing how to be self sufficient is good. You know, I could I could do that. Dude, um, are you are you like? I mean, I'm sorry, I'm bringing you back to the present and cutting you short. Sure. sure. See, an entrepreneur is never satisfied. An entrepreneur is never completely happy. Uh, what's your mental space like right now, dude? You've been through some <laughs> some intense ups and downs. But yeah. What, what do you what's what's your zone like right now? I I think I'm doing okay, honestly. I mean. I, you know, it, it does feel sometimes like I had a whole career already <laughs> in terms of the, yeah. the school and then doing a company and Pinterest and Gumroad and raising money and failing and being a profitable business now and being, a uh, you know, starting to become an investor on the side, like just feels like I'm, you know, I've had that. Um, I, I think part, partly that makes me feel good. You know, it makes me feel like, wow, I've had so much experience in such a short amount of time. I can yeah. take, I can slow they down. say that business... Yeah, business is the best uh, teacher for yourself. Like you become extremely self-aware because of running businesses. But I mean, um, it's a pretty brutal journey for the prize of self-awareness. So <laughs> while I'm sure that you've become self-aware, like are you are you okay with the brutality? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely easier to talk about in hindsight, right? I think in the moment, mm. I I remember being like, you know, I like I, I actually know the date, November fifth, two thousand fifteen. Uh, TechCrunch wrote, you know, put a front page story of like Gumroad does layoffs, uh, you know, seventy five percent of the company, uh, and you know, like that's the industry, that's like the paper record, right? So that's like waking up and like you know, the whole sort of Silicon Valley is. I, uh, you know, potentially talking about you, none of them are talking to me, right? Cause you don't want to, it's kind of like, you know, when, when, you know, your friend run, goes through something, you're not like, do I talk about, do I bring it? I don't know. The answer is <laughs> for what, for what it's worth. The answer is yes. You, you talk It's it's already on their mind. So you might as well like support them. Uh, I have a few people did, but yeah, it was definitely, you know, it was very lonely, you know, being a CEO is already lonely, but when you sort of fail in that way, so publicly, it's a very brutal sort of very brutal experience. You don't know who you can talk to about it. You're like, I gave up $50 million of Pinterest stock to do this. Like, like, was that a mistake? Like, you know, like all of these things run through your head. You know, I remember meeting, meeting, uh, I had a meeting at the office and I was like, do I cancel the meeting? There's no one in the office anymore. We have this big office with, you know, nobody's here except me. So I have the meeting like as if everything's normal. And, you know, years later, he he tells me, he's like, dude, that was so weird. Like you were clearly like, <laughs> you know, but I don't, I don't even remember, you know, I was just like on autopilot, just like, I need to make sure that things are just moving. And like, it's kind of like when you go, you know, it's like a traumatic experience. You're, you kind of just go into autopilot mode. Uh, and I, I felt like I was there for months and it took me leaving San Francisco and really figuring out like, you know, it's very difficult to, wait, if you have an identity, uh, like I'm the CEO of a company, it's very difficult to get rid of the an identity. It's very difficult to think of nothing, right? To go from thinking of something to thinking of nothing is like, you know, it takes a long time to get into that state. Uh, it's much easier to just think of something else, right? And so I think it 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 took me, a, you know, for six months or a year to realize, like living in San Francisco, just trying not to think about that is not going to work. I need to leave I need to write, I need to paint, I need to just get out of my head and like do something else, uh, which is what I ended up doing. And that's really what gave me, I think, physical distance literally really helped me just realize like that wasn't everything. When you're living in San Francisco, that is kind of everything, right? Uh, and you're on Twitter, that's kind of everything too. But when I moved, when I left San Francisco and I moved to Utah and I just started writing, uh, 
all of a sudden people didn't even know, right? People are like, Hey, what do you do? And I'm like, Oh, I'm just writing. Uh, you know, I work for, I'm a software engineer. I work for, a co- I would say I work for a company based out of San Francisco, <laughs> <laughs> which is true. I, I technically was accurate. Uh, but I, it just allowed me over time to, you know, once people start asking you these other questions, uh, you know, you almost forget, like you almost, you know, kind of are a lot, you give yourself that, that space. Um, otherwise you're constantly re- reattaching to your identity every time you talk about it, every time you bring it up. And so it, it took probably nine months or a year for me to really be like, okay, I can now look back at that experience and be like, okay, that was really meaningful and valuable for me. And that's what got me to the place where I ended up writing that, that, um, uh, essay a year and a half ago, reflecting on my failure to build a billion dollar company. Cause that was the first time it was, it was like December, I think of, of 20, uh, 17, uh, or 2018, 2018, it must've been when I, when I, I felt like come, so two years and I realized the reason I wrote that is I, re- I was talking to my mom and my high school friends and no one knew what happened. You know, I failed so visibly and so publicly and I, but I didn't want to tell anyone. I didn't want to address it because if someone hadn't read it, why would I, what, why would I tell them, Hey, by the way, I failed, you know, uh, uh, even though in hindsight, I realized probably everyone knew I just, you know, I should have just mm. probably addressed it anyway. But so that's definitely a lesson, but, uh, yeah, I just, I, f- I remember like people had all of these, it was like a telephone game, right? Someone would be like, did you, I heard you sold Gumroad, it shut down, you, like you're, you know, like all of these different stories. And I was like, I just need to correct the record. Like I just need to write from my <laughs> own voice what actually happened. Uh, and just, just for my friends and family, just to send them and be like, here you go, here's what happened. Uh, mm-hmm. And and then when I wrote it, the first, f- f- one or two drafts in, I was like, okay, there's like, when I'd send it to someone, they're like, this is amazing. You know, I need to send it to, I had a friend who did this and they need to, you know, they need to see this because very few people fail as publicly as you did after being as successful as you were so early. And then also feeling like, you know, talking about it. Um, and so I think it allowed people, I think 800,000 people ended up reading that article uh, and, you know, hundreds of people read it every day. And I think that's not because of some amazing uh skill that I have to write or whatever. It's just, I told a story that so many people wanted to hear, uh, and have seen mm-hmm. in their lives, but never, were, you know, it's very sort of, it, it very rare to really see someone put it, put it out there. Uh, and even, even like I sent it to my investors or the first people I sent it to, I'm like, Hey, I'm publishing this, uh, about the Gumroad journey. And there, there a lot of them are still investors in Gumroad. They're sort of just, we'll see what happens. Um, and, you know, a, a couple of them were like, wow, this is like, this is like, you know, flashbacks, uh, gives me flashbacks to, uh, you know, my own company from, you know, the nineties or, or, or what have you. Um, so I think, yeah, I think people, you know, people, people are always looking for, uh, for stories that were all the same, that we're all struggling, that we're all like figuring this stuff out. And there's so many founders that were like, wow, I thought you had all your shit together. And actually when, when Gumroad, when I was happy when the when the article came out because I was like, haha, finally, you know, he hit a ceiling and exploded like his rocket ship. You know, there's like jealousy, uh, and it just mm-hmm. it made me think like, wow, like that's such a terrible, you know, not that they're the you know like the, you know it's just like the amount of comparison and jealous like just like we're all so focused on other people and it's just like it was just such a terrible kind of realization that like. Um, has just made me really, really realize like I need to be in charge of my own emotional state, not Gumroad, not what I read on the internet. Um, my my head, like this, it's all here. Like literally everything, uh, you know, is happening in in a very small space. Uh, that you know, I should I should probably sort of focus on fo- focus on on clarifying a lot of those thoughts. So Steve Jobs said that as long as you have a vision, you don't really need motivation. The vision keeps pulling you. But at the same time, I feel on a day-to-day basis, every entrepreneur has this thing that he t- he or she turns to. And uh, for me, it's cricket, basketball, and Twitter. So what are those three slots for you? Like, what do you turn to in order to just keep yourself, for lack of a better word, fired up? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, reading, for sure. Uh, reading long-form books, typically. Uh on my Kindle. Would you, or, would you recommend like a bunch of them, like four, three or four books that like you have really helped you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, recently, um, I read, uh, where's my flying car, uh, the rational optimist by Matt Ridley. All of his books are, are phenomenal. Uh, I just read ice age, 
which is a phenomenal, really short uh, book around um, the ice ages. Um, uh, and just, just, you know, a lot of it, like they're not business books. You know, I read recently read the fabric of reality beginning of infinity uh, by, by David Deutsch. It's phenomenal. I read a lot of sci-fi as well. I think a, a lot of it for me is, is I, I love, I love physics and I, I love reading about just science because I think it, it grounds, like, it just reminds us, like, it reminds me of like how like weird society is sometimes like where we get caught up in these ideas but like you know the like reading about like wow the, the the earth is is you know is is really like a ball of fire like there's like a there's some there's mm. some rock but like down there there's literally just like molten lava and fire uh <laughs> and at some point there was just ice you know uh and it's just like it just i don't know it like really grounds you in a way where like you 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 just you don't realize like we're hurtling through space. You, yeah. <laughs> so you realize how small your problems are. Yeah. It, it, you get how small your problems are. Yeah. Ex- exactly. Exactly. And and how random and weird and you know how le- how uh, like you think you're in control because you can move from here to there, but you can't. You know, in the sort of context of the universe, your experiences are are relatively you know limited. Um, for 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 better or worse, I think it's just important to understand kind of like the natural prison that we're in, um, and under and sort of grok it and understand it, and that's that's really helpful. I really love books like Rational Optimist and Begin of Beginning of Infinity because they just inspire me with you know the the I, I like to say the present is fixed, right? Like the present is a fixed moment, whatever moment we're in, you can't do too much outside of it. You can't make a billion dollars tomorrow, um, but the you know over time like this like the outcomes of humanity are going to be so divergent right you could see a world in which the whole world's on fire uh or covered in ice again Mm -hmm. or we have flying cars or we have like you know we live in space or we go to mars like or Neuralink. i mean there's so many crazy things that could happen and i think there's this there's this concept of the black swan right like uh, nasim taleb phenomenal book all of his books are great highly recommend them all especially skin in the game but we, I think society, we obsess over that. We obsess over the black swans. We're actually pretty good about realizing them now, I feel like. Mm. You know, COVID happened. We're like, we're all screwed, like almost immediately, right? <laughs> uh, and so I think he, 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 he won because he kind of convinced everybody to, you know, to pay attention to these tail risks. But I almost think we don't spend enough time thinking about the white swans. Like what are all the, the internet, mm. uh, cryptocurrency, who knows what? Like there's so many amazing things that could happen. Uh, that like tomorrow, right? Like you're like, oh, we're going to have self-driving cars or we're going to have, you know, robots in 50 years. And then you see like a video that Elon Musk does and you're just like, oh, maybe like five years. <laughs> like your your conception <laughs> of the future changes so quickly, uh, you know, based on technology and innovations and research. And, you know, like there's so many people working at a future all the time that we don't really see every day. Like, but somehow your phone gets better. You know, like your life is getting better. You just You just don't notice it. It's kind of like watching grass grow, but you open up, you know, you look at like, go to archive.org and go to twitter.com. Like you go to any website and you're like, what? This was the internet that we used like five years ago. Um, mm. So I think it's always helpful for me to like, to like, you know, like to, to like both stay constrained in the present and realize like I'm only in so much control of this uh, sort of stoic, I guess. But then also realizing the future is, can be crazy. And I just, I love books because I just think they're, they're, they're just, they're so refined, right? Like when you read a book, you're getting like so many like filters on it. And I just love, when you read words like that, it's just, insp- it's just like, wow, like hu- humans are possible of creating this amazing stuff. Um, mm. It's just like, it's like art. It's like reading art, you know? And I think being Daisy, like, I think it, it, you know, it really made, at least it, it felt like I was continuing a, a journey. Like, you know, my grandparents were not, uh, you know, would not be considered successful. They're, you know, poverty basically in India. And then my parents grew up in poverty, but were able to transcend that and go to America and get their educations and, and do quite well. And then I, you know, it, it, it's like, I have an obligation to continue, you know, it, to continue that. And I think one of the things that I don't, sometimes it gets controversial in, in America. Um, but I think one of the things about like the sort of Desi culture um, that I see at least is like, it's, it's, it's very much about like, you know, it's your job to be successful. And when you have examples of that, like this person grew up here and, and, and escaped in a sense, like, you know, was able to transcend their experience. I it's hard for me to come up with excuses, you know, 
like even even with the Gumroad stuff, like I always tell people, like, look, like I definitely struggled. Like I, I, I. But but you are successful right now, man. Like, yeah. Oh, now anybody yeah. Looks at you. Now yes, but even even in the downs, you know, the down parts, I was like, this is not incomparable to what my parents went through. Like I, I think like even when I moved to Utah, you know, people are like, how are you going to move to Utah? That's so crazy. I'm like, there's Uber and Airbnb. I'm like, what do you? <laughs> like my parents, like, you know, like when you moved, in, you know, in the 80s, like you moved, like you're writing letters to, you know, like it's a very different experience. And so I, I think that's true for every, every, everyone, not just sort of Desi culture. But I think like when you see people within one or two generations, you, you're just like, I can do it. Like the, the, the sky is the limit. And I think that's that's the way that my, my, my parents and my mom, I think, was slightly less traditional in that way where she wasn't like, you need to go to school. You need to do this. She was definitely like, you know, you should probably, uh, but also like, you know, they struggled, I think, to give me the freedom to choose, uh, it, you know, and I think I always, I always appreciated that where they were like, you know, luckily mm -hmm. I think it's going to work out anyway, but you know, they were like, look, you, you know, we worked really hard and did whatever it took so that you could do whatever you want. And so don't, don't waste your life on like being even more rich or even more of this or whatever. Like we already did that. Like have fun, do what you love. Uh, and I think ironically, I think it means that I will probably do pretty well financially as well. But, you know, I think that was always empowering to me that like my, my parents weren't constraining me in that way um, mm. uh, that I, I think was, was mean, but I see it all the time. I see it in like people like, I can't speak for people like Naval and Balaji and, and Chamath and stuff, but there is something about, you know, there's something there. I think about experiencing that culture and having that perspective and being like, look, yeah, people say things on the street sometimes, you know, I'm not saying it's like a idyllic, yeah. but like, who cares? Like, that's not going to, I'm not going to give up because of that. Capitalistic question. When you look at India from the outside, what's your viewpoint on the startup ecosystem or just the opportunities for international businesses to kind of, Look at India and say, oh, shit, we can sell our stuff here. Yeah. I mean, I, there, what's your viewpoint on it? I think it's absolutely massive. I mean, I think if I were doing a ton of uh, like, I still think, you know, I'm lucky I have a great network in San Francisco. And so that's probably where I'm going to be investing most of my investment capital and and other things. But I definitely think like out, I do. I try to do a little bit outside of America and they're focused on basically two sectors or two geographies. One is Africa and one is India. Um, and I think those two economies, if I had to sort of guess, like, you know, where is the most growth, most growth going to be coming from? It's going to be those, those two. And I think, again, it kind of comes down to, I think, which, a lot which of part cultural. of, which part of Africa specifically? I mean, like Lagos, Nigeria, uh, is, you know, is probably the most developed Zambia um, as well, like that part of, of, of Africa, Egypt, et cetera. Like, I think there's just so much growth there, but I think. A lot of it comes down to culture, right? Like I think you can replicate Silicon Valley, but you have to figure out what mean. Like you know, it's not a geography thing; it's a cultural thing, and figuring out why. Like failure is acceptable. People pay it forward. There's equity financing. There's minimal regulation, and the countries that figure that out and are able to implement that system, uh, like Hong Kong was for China, or Singapore was for Southeast Asia. Like figuring out, or New York was for you know America back in the day. Like figuring out, okay, how do we allow people to innovate? Um, and the, the 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 big question is: Will people uh, be able to control their own destinies, and will people be able to f be rewarded financially by that? Right? Because ultimately, it's that sco scorecard thing, and I think it does matter. I think creating an incentive pattern for for folks who are insanely ambitious to just like work to the bone so that they can build these amazing things for people. People just don't do that. It's hard. It's painful. Most people fail. People aren't going to do that if there's like a, a an okay exit at the end of the tunnel. There needs to be this crazy, mm -hmm. crazy outcome. And I think the governments that can figure out how do we allow that to happen and, you know, corruption sort of makes sense, I think, in the short term for certain people, but it almost always hurts long term. And I think that, the, you know, the, the things that a lot of these growing economies figure out is minimize corruption, allow people to innovate, make it easy to start a business, make everything open and transparent. Uh, and, and, and allow people to invest and get equity in these small projects to incentivize people to give money to them and then let those those things do do, do amazing things. But yeah, I, I would say India 
is going to, is going to explode. I mean, I think the amount of, uh, sort of like things happening there, um, around technology and broadband and, uh, internet connectivity and phones, uh, and payments, like, I just think it's going to be really, uh, uh, really amazing. And I, I think ultimately the whole world is going to be where America and, you know, is like in terms of, uh, obviously America is not perfect. We have plenty of our own problems. Uh, but, but I think in terms of sort of GDP per capita and how much money is being spent on what and infrastructure investments, like, and so it's, it's just an easy bet to make because it just seems inevitable to me that at some point, you know, there's no difference. Hiring an engineer in India is the same as hiring an engineer in San Francisco is the same as hiring an engineer in Lagos. And so, in general, that's, it's easier to make those bets. If you're investing, you should invest in those too because they're, they have the most room to grow, right? Um, but I see a ton of stuff. I see a ton of stuff in India. I've made one investment in, in an Indian company in Pesto. And uh, I, he's I, a very, very dear friend of mine. Oh, yeah. Ayush is a very, very close awesome. friend. We've had him on the show. Oh, cool. A lot. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I think that like, and a lot of it, you know, comes down to the people, right? Like it comes down to, you have to find those people and you have to have an environment. And currently people like me immigrate, right? And so India has to do what it can to keep people. If it wants to see that influx, they, they, you have to keep people there. You have to reward people for not, for staying. Luckily COVID creates like a year or two of forced staying. Uh, and hopefully like the governments can react in a way that like, you know, makes that more permanent, uh, permanent yeah. over time as well. Yeah, man. You know, the thing you said about people leaving, uh, it's partly uh, this, I mean, success stories like you, your family, people have seen that and said that, okay, there's a better life out there. I completely get that. A big chunk of it is this thing about a status driven society. There's this Indian entrepreneur called Kunal. Are you familiar with this wealth driven society versus status driven yeah, society? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, India's, a, I mean, all Asian countries are. Uh, but India specifically is an extremely status driven society and a lot of middle class parents here associate the idea of success with a comfortable life in America. Uh, but I am seeing a change in Indian kids' mindsets. For example, I'm 27 now. Back when I was in college, that was considered successful. That okay, I, I've, I've left the country now. I'm beginning my life somewhere else. Uh, nowadays, people kind of associate success with wealth driven societal ideas. And they associate success with um, someone taking on that journey of entrepreneurship. All the stuff you spoke about, the brutality, the self-awareness. So 19-year-old, 18-year-old Indians from urban centers, from small towns, they're thinking way differently than they were five years ago. So my big hope is that India is going to become some kind of a outsourcing capital. Like that's the kind of work that Pesto is doing where they take work from all over the world and give it to like smart Indian coders or whatever and say that, okay, you know, uh, we, we're the connectors. The whole world outsources their coding or their content creation needs to us. Uh, and I don't know why, man, but I do feel that India will have a role to play in the AI revolution that happens in the world. Primarily because I feel like... Uh, Culturally, we have a fantastic EQ. I, do, I, I, I don't know whether it's the whole family culture or what, but this has just been my experience. That we're very empathetic human beings. And I have been reading a lot about AI lately, and I have figured that besides the technical aspect of it, to create really good artificial intelligence products, even in like a uh, on a mental level, you know, just to be able to conceptualize a really good AI product, you need to be extremely empathetic as a human, as is the case with all businesses, but specifically AI, because you're trying to replicate a human being within a product. Yeah. So my gut is that India will have a role to play in the AI revolution. But what do you think? Do you think that makes sense? Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. I mean, I definitely agree that AI requires the most empathy because you're literally trying to create that sort of experience. Uh, it's very hard to do that if you, if you don't have that ability. Um, and I definitely think, I think, you know, just like when you go to a big city, there's like a district here that does this, there's this over here, there's different subcultures, right? And I think the world will resemble a city effectively at some point where you'll have, mm. you know, certain things over here, certain things over here, and like more freedom of movement so people can move back and forth. But ultimately the geography, the topology, the culture, you know, it's like, you know, even if you, if you think about olive oil, like it's all made in Italy, you know, like it's still like there's certain places that I think become known for something and they become, they sort of get the gravity 
And then everyone who cares about that moves there and it kind of continues and continues. And I think India will figure out like what, what is it really phenomenal at? Is it uh, manufacturing? Is it coding? Is it software development? Is it AI? Is it content production? Uh, it'll be a lot of those things, I think. Um, and it, you know, the, the reason to leave is going to go down for sure. As, as India improves, mm. as, as you know, these sort of other societies kind of hit their asymptotes, as it becomes easier to kind of like cross pollinate an idea. Like before, you know, I remember when the iPhone came out, it was only an American product. Like you couldn't get it. You know, you'd have to like have a friend or someone like, you know, uh, and then it came to the UK and Singapore and now it's like assumed everywhere. Right. And so over time, like there's just going to be less reason. Uh, the number one reason to build software in America is you just have a market, a big market willing to pay for stuff. So you start an American company, you have a lot of people to sell to. Uh, and as the sort of, as India grows, it's sort of like a, it's its own snowball, right? Where it becomes, it's like mm. less people are going to leave because there's more opportunity, which is going to create more opportunity. So even less people are going to leave. And all of a sudden, like, you know, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to not make that much sense to leave at all. Right. Beautiful. Sahil Lavignia. Thank you, brother. Thank I you. hope you had fun on this episode. Uh, I hope I helped you with some more of that self-discovery journey that you're on because that's what podcasts do for me. If I'm ever on a podcast, it always helps you a little bit more. And I hope that it was the case for you as well. I'll be linking all your handles down below. Uh, any last message for the listeners? One last sentence for the world. Uh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, follow me on Twitter. That would be awesome. Uh, but <laughs> but otherwise, you know, I'm I'm super accessible. I mean, that's like the... The thing, we'll see how long I can maintain it, but I always try to be really responsive to emails and everything like that. So my, all of this is, you know, is Googleable, And so, you know, if, you know, again, like you're in charge of your own success and you're not going to get help if you don't ask uh, and if you're not worth helping. So, you know, make sure you're there. And then you'll be surprised, I think, at how, how much the world will like contort to, to allow you to do what you want to do. Um, because and people are selfish and they, you know, if they believe you, you know, that you can improve their lives. Like I think, I think in general, they will, they will look past some of these other things and, 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 and help you do that. So. Beautiful. Thank you, brother. Thank I you. I appreciate you being on the show. We'll do a show the next time you're in Mumbai as well. Yeah, I've, I'm, I know I've been wanting to, uh, but uh, yeah, hopefully after this whole debacle, we will, uh, I will do a big yeah, trip and it'll be fun beautiful.